It's getting hot in here, so pour yourself a shot. I am getting too hot, I'm gonna pour myself a shot. It seems like the natural progression of a bourbon geek is to become relatively obsessed with barrel-proof bourbons and rye. I mean, it's not mandated. It's not a natural order. But it seems like that's the general flow of things. You get into American whiskey, you're tasting all the things, and it seems like your tolerance for proof escalates. Not only your tolerance, but your preference for higher proof whiskeys just seems to come with it. Come with the game. Come with the, the passion. And as we look at the secondary value of bottles, we can actually see that there is a correlation, maybe causation, but at least correlation between the proof point of a particular product and its secondary value. A good example of this would be the George T. Stagg releases. Some of the most coveted, highly valued George T. Stagg releases are the quote unquote hazmats, those in the 140 proof range. Whereas some of the lowest valued George T. Stagg releases are like the 2019, where it actually came in below 120 proof. It's interesting. As you look at the shelf too, everything that is barrel proof demands a higher price point. Quite a bit higher, even. Like more than you'd think for just not diluting the whiskey. It's not a proportional increase in price. It's more than proportional. So today we're talking about what's the deal with barrel proof whiskey? Why is it worth more? Why is it that bourbon geeks seem to prefer higher proof whiskeys in general? Is it better? Is higher proof or is barrel proof better? That's what we're going to talk about today. If you're new to the channel, thanks for joining us. I'm proud of you. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, if you do, get down and smash the like button below. Leave me a comment and subscribe. That'd be dope. If you don't like the video, that's okay. You are entitled to your opinion. If you dig this, just know that every week I tend to break down brands and bourbon, topics, things that you might generally want to know about. I like to consider this a virtual bar. I mean, right now it's COVID and a lot of us can't get together and assemble and bull crap about whiskey. So this is a great forum for that. So today our topic is barrel proof whiskey, specifically bourbons and ryes. What is the deal with barrel proof whiskey? First, let's get technical. Let's handle the technical components. What, what is it? What is barrel proof whiskey? Well, in some cases, it's really good, but so are non-barrel proof bourbons and rye. So what is it? Well, in its most simplest form, it is bourbon or rye or any whiskey really that is emptied from the cask and it's not diluted with water before it goes into the barrel, the bottle, misspoke. So no dilution, it's just that simple. Now, there is a high variance between barrel-proof whiskeys. Like, not all barrel-proof whiskeys are created equal, and they, they actually, a lot of them don't get anywhere close to each other in terms of actual alcohol content or taste profile. For example, I've seen whiskeys range from everywhere from like an 89 and a half proof, which I have right here, the Russell's 2003, that is cask strength, barrel proof, which means the same. Cask strength, barrel strength, barrel proof, it all means the same. That Russell's is below 90 proof, but it's barrel proof. It's not diluted, no water added. That's crazy. Whereas I mentioned that the George T. Stagg has mats, and there are some Elijah Craig's out there as well that have been over 140 proof. That's what we gen generally refer to as hazmat status. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive <laughs> how much alcohol is in one of those 140 proof bourbons. This high level of variance is caused by a few things. One would be there is a variation from distillery to distillery in what's called entry proof. Entry proof is the strength of the new make spirit that goes into the barrel. So not everybody puts their raw whiskey, their white whiskey, their white dog into the barrel at the same proof. Now, a lot of the, the big names in the industry, Heaven Hill, Buffalo Trace, Jim Beam, they actually, they, they 
do find entry proof in common, and that's 125. So that's the max that you can put new make spirit into a barrel in and call it bourbon according to the regulations about what bourbon has to be. Can't come off the still at higher than 160 proof, can't go into the barrel at more than 125 proof. Now other distilleries, their entry proof is lower. Like Wild Turkey, for instance, for a long time, their entry proof was 107. Now it's 114. MGP and Four Roses are 120, and uh, Maker's Mark is 110. Now there's a lot of debate about how entry proof impacts flavor overall, and I actually have no idea, because I, I wouldn't know <laughs> if it actually does. Um, Old-timey wisdom would say that a lower entry proof yields a better end product, which is why Wild Turkey had 107 for such a long time and Makers has done 110. A higher entry proof does allow the distillers when they're bottling to get more out of a particular barrel. Like if it's going in at 125 proof, odds are it's gonna come out at a higher alcohol by volume than if it's going in at 110 proof, which means if your end product was 90 proof, you can actually dilute the product more, stretch it more, and make more money. So there's economic reasons to go in at a higher proof. And uh, given that some of the best distillers and best products come out of these 125 entry proofs, I can't say categorically whether or not a higher or lower entry proof is better. But to our point today in this video, we're not, it's not talking about the the quantifiable impacts of entry proof, it's talking about barrel proofs, you can see how there would be a big variance between like a wild turkey barrel proof at 114 entry proof, it's probably gonna come in lower than a Heaven Hill barrel proof, uh, which starts at 125 proof. So those entry proofs will impact what the final proof is. The other thing is gonna be evaporation. And this is different from distillery to distillery, warehouse to warehouse, or rickhouse to rickhouse, and then place in the rickhouse. Uh, evaporation is supposed to take place at a much higher rate on the higher floors of the distilleries, which get hot as balls in the summertime. Um, and so their evaporation rate's gonna differ from the lower ricks in the rickhouse, where it's much cooler. And thus the alcohol content is gonna vary quite a bit because alcohol evaporates like crazy. It's, it's so volatile. There have been instances where distilleries went to bottle like their limited release and they meant to do one batch. I forget where this happened. I think it may have been birthday bourbon one year where it was tanked and then half of it was bottled and then they went back to bottle the other half, but some of the alcohol had evaporated, the proof was changed, so then they had to have basically two batches of birthday bourbon instead of the one because of the change in alcohol, because they couldn't mislabel it. Alcohol will evaporate very quickly. So if you have rick houses that generally run pretty hot, you may have some lower alcohol by volume barrel proofs. Or the opposite. It seems like whenever there's a high level of evaporation, it's a total crapshoot based on what I've read. Some barrels go up in proof, some go down. Science. And again, I've personally seen this range of, of barrel proof all the way from 89 up to 141. I heard about 1792 barrels coming in at over 160 proof barrel strength which sounds bonkers. And it's kind of crazy to imagine it going from 125 proof new make spirit in the barrel up to 160 proof, but apparently it has and can, can and has and will. But I've never seen anything bottled above like 141 point something. Now that we understand that, let's just get a few takes here. Let's kind of break this down a little bit. First off, there's something inherently dope about drinking whiskey straight from the barrel, like undiluted, uncut, unfiltered. Like those are awesome words. Like those resonate with the core of my being. This is uncut, unfiltered, straight from the barrel. Heck yeah. I mean, I just feel like I'm getting everything that the bourbon had to offer or rye as the case may be. And I like that, it feels authentic. Second thing, Technically, whiskey without water added to it, undiluted, should be more concentrated in flavor. Like that's just, that's logic. If you start with this barrel proof concentrated product, 
you don't add water, it's concentrated. You add water, it's less concentrated. So regardless of what the proof point is, when you start with uncut bourbon, you've got the most flavor that you can possibly get in there, in there. Like you can only take flavor away at that point or stretch flavor out. So that's pretty cool. I like that, like that so far. And, and it's really for that reason, primarily, other than the allure of uncut, unfiltered, um, that I like barrel-proof whiskeys is that concentration level, that's what I want. I mean, let me mess with it to decide how far I want to stretch the flavor out, or if I want to. Like, give me the bourbon as God intended, straight from the barrel, and let me decide how it goes into my mouth. I appreciate that. Now, an important point to note is what I'm saying about uh, whiskey, this bourbon, this rye being the most concentrated flavor-wise that it can be straight out of the barrel. Uh, I'm not referencing alcohol content in relationship to flavor. Like the alcohol content does vary from barrel to barrel, but each barrel is giving you all the flavor it can regardless of the alcohol content. So I'm saying that barrel-proof whiskey so if I had two barrel-proof whiskeys side by side here, and one of them had a higher alcohol content than the other, but they're both barrel-proof, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because one has a higher alcohol content that it has a higher flavor amount or more intense flavors or more richness in flavor. Like alcohol doesn't necessarily correlate to really yummy flavor vibes. It's really important to know. Alcohol does not necessarily mean flavor, okay? In fact, a whiskey with a higher alcohol content may actually be harder for you to assess and appreciate than an, a whiskey with a lower alcohol content. Science tells us this. Um, alcohol is actually corrosive, especially in these high uh, ABV concentrations. Like when you're getting up to 120, 130, 140 proof, you know, 70% alcohol by volume, that much alcohol can do some damage to living tissue, um, which is why it hurts. Like it, it makes sense that when you drink uh, bourbon, this one's like 130 some proof. Yeah, 130.6. It hurts my mouth the longer I leave it in there. It's damaging the cells in my oral cavity, which, I mean, some of us find pleasant to a degree. I mean, not that we're masochistic or anything, but you know, the Kentucky hug, that bite, we enjoy that part of the experience. So I'm not talking about whether or not you like the experience right now. I'm talking about your ability to perceive flavor. Because alcohol is corrosive and it does damage those cells, it does burn, it actually, when you drink it, makes it harder for you to taste the other compounds in the particular glass of whiskey that you're drinking. There's tons of other flavored compounds up in here that deliver things like spicy notes, sweet notes, floral notes, fruity notes, and those notes are more perceptible to your palate the lower the alcohol is. Now it does get to a point where you dilute it so much that even though the alcohol is lower and you could technically perceive it more, you diluted it so much that those notes are harder to pick up. But our boy, who is no longer with us, Elmer T. Lee um, of Buffalo Trace Lore, this bro was famous for diluting bourbon down to sub 80 proof, down to like 35% alcohol by volume to do his tasting because that's where he tasted best. And I dare say most human beings would. Not that we would enjoy it most at that proof point, but we would be able to assess it best. Like it just allows our mouth to not die while we taste the whiskey. It's less damaging to your olfactory cellular structure. Now I'm not saying again that lower proof or higher proof is better than the other necessarily. That's just the science of it. Is while there is more concentration, it may be harder for you to taste and enjoy a higher proof bourbon than it would a lower proof bourbon. So it may be best to get a barrel strength bourbon that is you know, less than 110 proof, maybe even 100 proof, maybe, maybe even 90 proof, 
that has all the concentrated, yummy, delicious flavor of a barrel strength undiluted bourbon, but doesn't have the damaging impact of a higher proof, like 120, 130, 140 proof bourbon. Maybe you could at least, I could guarantee, assess it easier without it burning your mouth. But that's really a, a preference point. Maybe you like the burn. I kind of do like the burn sometimes. So let's ask the question then. Is barrel proof better necessarily than non-barrel proof? Or is higher proof whiskey better than lower proof? So those are two different questions really. First one, is barrel proof bourbon better than non-barrel proof bourbon? Well, my contention is yes. <laughs> yes, because not necessarily because it has a higher alcohol content, but because it gives me the ability to actually add water to find the proof point that I like the best. Most of the time I keep it neat. You guys know this. I don't add water to my bourbon as a general, general rule, but general rules are meant to be broken. And in particular, some of the heavy, heavy hitting barrel strength bourbons like Elijah Craig, or Stag Jr., there have been releases of those that I have, an enjo I have enjoyed more with water, like diluting down slightly because they've been so hot. It's just like, this is more pain than gain right now. And strength is not necessarily the addition of pain. Like pain is not weakness leaving the body. That's uh, machismo. It's uh, not accurate. So just because something is painful doesn't mean it's good. Just because something is high proof doesn't mean it's good. And it's not bad for you to add a little water to your bourbon. If somebody's gonna give you flack for that, well, that's just dumb. So while I like barrel proof bourbon better because it gives me more options, like I like buying it more, I can stretch it longer if I want to, or I can enjoy the fullness it has to offer, I definitely don't think it's bad to add water to bourbon. Many people, especially newbies into bourbon, will probably enjoy it more. And science tells us if you're a taster, you can definitely assess the core of that bourbon or rye and what it's offering you from a flavor perspective and flavor note perspective, you can assess it better than if you left it at barrel strength. Now, when it comes to the barrel strength bourbons, saying we had two side by side, is a higher proof or a lower proof better? You know, it really depends. I couldn't say categorically because each barrel is so different from the next one. Each batch of bourbon is so different from the next one. Like, so I might say I get stoked when I see a lower proof barrel strength bourbon because to me that's going to deliver a lot of flavor without an overwhelming sense of heat. I get nervous if I see the proof go above 130. And especially if it gets into the 135 because it's hard to be able to taste really well when the proof level is that high. So if there's somebody out there who got George T. Stag 2019 and they're bummed about it because it's a lower proof point than the other Stag releases, well, number one, don't fret. Number two, if you stay bummed, just send it to me and I will handle it for you. I'm happy to take that, take it for the team. So the deal with Barrel Proof Bourbon is it's really cool. It's really, really, really cool and uh, in bourbon, we like to hype things. So if it's cool and it can be really tasty, then it's going to get hyped and self-propagate. And that's what we've seen happen is there's the general consensus that a higher proof means more flavor, more intensity, certainly more intense, but not always more flavor, certainly not always more perceptible flavor. So be careful when you're buying barrel proof, barrel strength, cast strength whiskeys, because higher proof does not always mean a better end product. But at the end of the day, generally, I think barrel proof is pretty dank. That's it for this week. Hope you dug. Again, don't hesitate to send me a message, comment below, like this video, subscribe, do whatever you need to do to make sure that you enjoy videos like this in the future. Be swell. You should, if you're not planning on this already, Tune into my live stream coming up this Thursday night at 8 o'clock Central Time. I'm announcing some big news. Getting ready for a Kentucky trip. I actually leave Friday morning to head down to the motherland, as it were, Kentucky, do some bourbon hunting, and start a really cool project. And on Thursday at 8 o'clock Central Time, I'm going to have a guest on, and, I'm, and we're going to talk about this upcoming project. So don't miss out on that. It's going to be pretty swell. Swell time, swell vibes. Thanks for the watch today. I hope your week is off to a pretty killer start. Whenever you're watching this, the week you're having, I hope, is, is rad.
So stay healthy, stay safe, and remember to keep it neat with water sometimes if you need it.